continue multi-level models this week. The goal this week is to take the principles from last week, uh, the principles of pooling and the shrinkage benefits it brings, uh, to harder problems, uh, more complex structures. Uh, the principle of pooling can be applied not only to multiple intercepts, uh, but to other kinds of parameters as well, and you want to do it. It's not only that you, that you can, you should. Uh, why should you? Because you get better estimates uh, if you do it. So I want to give you a number of examples today of the strategy uh, that's usually called varying or random slopes. Uh, slopes being the, the parameters that um, uh, code quote unquote effects. Uh, and, uh, uh, but we'll also, <coughs> at the end of this week on Friday, talk about an extension of these principles to uh, uh, continuous categories, instead of discrete categories as well. Okay, uh, terminological background uh, to begin. Uh, last week we talked about models that contain varying intercepts. These are cases where the intercept parameters for different clusters in the data uh, are given uh, uh, unique parameters, unique values in the posterior distribution, and we estimate them uh, through partial pooling. Uh, we do that by giving them a parent prior that has parameters in it, and we estimate those parameters from the data at the same time as we estimate the intercepts, and that creates pooling and shrinkage, which handles the imbalance of sampling and all the other things that would normally create terror and error in uh, classical fixed effects models. Um, and the, uh, to remind you, that assumption of a common adaptive prior arises from uh, a quite simple and reasonable assumption that uh, uh, the order you visit the clusters in should not matter, and that uh, while they are different from one another, they're also alike in some way. Uh, so if you if you think that previous cafes you've been to should give you some reasonable expectation about the next cafe you go to, then you should estimate things about those cafes using a pooling estimator. To do otherwise would be, well, it would be bad. <laughs> You'd be throwing away information. You would overfit uh, uh, each um, each cafe. So that's varying intercepts. And varying intercepts give you uh, uh, the stylistic diagram on the top right of this slide where the different regression lines, um, if there's some predictor variable on the horizontal axis in this graph and then a, an outcome variable on the vertical, you get different regression lines for each cluster, but they're all parallel because they have the same slope. Yeah? The slopes are still the same. The only thing that's varying across clusters is the intercept. Uh, however, if the intercepts vary, chances are the slopes vary. Why? Because slopes and intercepts tend to co-vary in these things. It's the thing about lines. If you change the intercept, you tend to change the slope. Uh, otherwise, it won't pass through the data anymore. <laughs> right? So it's, it's a feature of these things. It doesn't have to be true. You can invent some bizarre scenario in which the slopes are all the same across clusters, but the intercepts are different. Uh, but uh, it's, it isn't obviously the most reasonable thing to do. Uh, so. If, if uh, the average can vary across clusters, then the effect of some treatment or intervention can also vary across clusters. Uh, and we want to uh, try to understand that. And that leads us to varying slopes, cases where uh, the change in the outcome for a given change in the predictor uh, also varies across cluster. And that's the stylistic diagram in the lower right, where now there's a regression line for each cluster in the data. So this is a cafe or a school. Um, uh, any number of things, and as we uh, uh, change uh, the horizontal axis, uh, we get different relationships. So in the, in the school context, there's a, uh, a famous uh, school database that's often used to teach these uh, concepts. I will not use it, but uh, where what you're thinking of is the economic background of students inside different schools, and the horizontal axis here would be, it would be that. It would be household income of various students, and the vertical axis is test scores. And then each line is the regression line for a school. And so in some schools, um, the, the income of a household has a big effect on the student's test scores. And in other schools, it doesn't because, well, the teaching's good. <laughs> Something like that. I mean, that prejudges the conclusion, but that's the idea why, why educators are interested in these things. Um, uh, they want those lines to be flat, right? And when the lines instead go up, as they usually do, it's reason for panic. Right. Uh, some of you may remember around the year 2002 in Germany, the PISA results came out. There was national panic 
over uh, the fact that income had a huge relationship to school performance in Germany. Yeah, I remember that. I was at the institute that did the piece, I think, at the time. So, yeah, it was all alarms were going off about this. It was a, it was a full-blown panic, right? So these are the kinds of regressions you do uh, to look at these things. Um, okay, so the, but the general principle here that I want you to think about is there's nothing special about intercepts or slopes. It's just any parameter, if you have clusters in the data, repeat observations on some units, you can take any parameter that applies to those units and split it into a big vector of parameters, one for each unit. And then you want to estimate them with pooling. Uh, that's the general strategy. And this happens in a, a lot of circumstances. Um, <coughs> Uh, in, in all kinds of different sorts of models. So, uh, you, yeah, this is the recipe, right? One and two here. You split the parameter into a vector of parameters, one for each cluster, and then you define some population distribution for all of them so they have some distribution uh, that forms a common prior, and that distribution will be estimated from the data. Uh, the practical reasons to do this uh, are that you get better estimates, and you can ask questions about distributions in in the population of interest, rather than just average effects. So this is um, uh, hot right now in uh, medicine, is this idea that average effects can be misleading. I would say hot right now. This has been hot for decades, but I guess now people are trying to make money off of it. So, uh, but it's not silly. Uh, it's the idea that, um, well look, it's a fact that for lots of common pain relievers, um, they don't affect everybody the same way. So things like, common things like aspirin, some people get a lot more benefit from aspirin than other people do. And so it makes sense to pay attention to which common pain relievers actually work best for you. And so you can test people on these things and the pain relieving uh, abilities. In that sense, the average effect in the population isn't of clinical importance, right? It, it can easily be true for various medications that the average person gets no therapeutic benefit of a medication. Nevertheless, thousands of people could benefit from the medication, right? This is not unusual, especially once you start considering drug interactions. The fact that you're taking some other medication. Sorry, I'm getting old, so I think about this all the time now. But, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, prior to aging parents, I think about medication a lot. <laughs> I mean, this is how it how it goes. But uh, it's, it's, this is not silly, right? This is this is a, a, a tremendous potential benefit um, if we can figure out the information uh, requirements to make this work at scale. And uh, but it applies to all kinds of things, uh, regardless of what you study. I'll try to give you an example uh, later on today. Um, it, I'm not going to rush, uh, but I think I'll make it in time, uh, if not on Friday, where the average effect of a predictor is, uh, is basically zero. It's not exactly zero. It's never exactly zero, right? But so close to zero that you think, like, oh, I could ignore this predictor. Nevertheless, uh, there's enough variation across units in the effect that you don't want to ignore the predictor. So this is the thing about multi-level models and varying slopes models is that the average effect of a predictor variable, of an X variable, can be indistinguishable from zero, uh, extremely close to precisely estimated around zero. Nevertheless, you would get better predictions if you pay attention to the predictor. Why? Because for some units, there's a big effect. Yeah, am I making sense? I'll, I'll give you an example when we get there. Okay, uh, yeah, and so uh, pooling estimators, uh, all the same things apply. Um, it helps us with the overfitting, underfitting trade-off. So let me give you uh, this, this um, continue with this coffee robot example from the from the previous chapter um, and extend it now into thinking about slopes. So to remind you, I had this toy example where you're imagining uh, your job is to program some robot to go around and sample waiting times to get coffee at various cafes. And don't ask why. It's a stats class. Get examples like this in stats classes. And the question is how you want to program the robot to use the information. And I tried to convince you, and I hope I succeeded, that you want to program the robot to use a pooling estimator. <laughs> right? And so when it visits a new cafe, it uses the previous cafes as a prior, uh, but then it uh, updates that prior given the experience it has at the new cafe, but hang on, it has now to simultaneously update the prior because it's got new data about the population. Uh, and then it has to update all the previous cafes as well because the prior has been updated. Yeah? <laughs> and it, so how do you do this? Well, Bayesian model, pooling estimator, all that happens automatically. Bayes formula does it for you. You don't have to be clever. You just set up the assumptions and uh, start counting ways that data could happen. Um, so let's, let's take the same coffee robot now, and now we're going to ask the robot to distinguish between morning and afternoon at cafes, because cafes tend to be busier in the morning uh, than they are in the afternoon. And or, uh, I think, is that the way I did this? 
uh, and um, uh, yes, <laughs> they're busier in the morning than the afternoon. And uh, so your average wait time in the morning is longer at, at uh, most cafes uh, than it is in the afternoon. And so the coffee robot is now keeping separate ledgers at each cafe for the, uh, the amount of time it took for it to get its cup of coffee. You can imagine the, the barista giving a cup of coffee to the Roomba that has come in. Right. I actually Googled for Roomba with a cup of coffee on it and failed uh, <laughs> to find it. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I tried. That's all I can say. Is I tried. Maybe next time I teach this, I'll get Photoshop out and, and go to work. Um, but well, we have a multimedia department downstairs. I'll get them on this. Right. Put a ticket in <laughs> for this. Um, but uh, anyway, back to back to statistics. Uh, so. Uh, on the right-hand side of this slide, I've given you some synthetic data to illustrate what I'm talking about. There's two cafes, creatively called A and B, and uh, on the vertical axis we have the wait time in minutes, and on the horizontal are sequential visits, uh, M for morning, A for afternoon. And so each, the data points from each day are uh, connected with a line. You can see in cafe A, on average, um, there's a much shorter wait time in the afternoons, right? Fewer people are there getting their morning coffee. And uh, uh, it's probably the mechanism. We don't know. This is just the data. The robot just has data like this. That's all it's got. And Cafe B, it's also true that um, when uh, there is a shorter wait time, uh, any kind of substantial shorter wait time, it tends to be in the afternoon. But there's much less difference. Cafe B is just a lot less busy or more efficient. It's hard to say. Could be less popular. <laughs> but the, the wait times in Cafe B are really short. And the difference between morning and afternoon isn't, isn't very large. This is a case where, now what's, where's the slope in this? The slope is the average difference between afternoon and morning. And the slopes will vary across the cafes. And they, in fact, they have to because the zero boundary on the wait time is a real boundary. You can't go below it, right? You can't have a negative wait time for your coffee, I assert, as part of the physics of the measurement of this, right? They don't telepathically, well, I get with an app, I guess you could say, I'm coming for my coffee. But uh, let's leave that out, out of the example. And so the minimum is zero. So as you approach that, as your average wait time in the morning approaches zero, the slope has to get smaller. It has to. And that creates a correlation between the intercept and the slope. And this is a routine phenomenon in linear models, is that slopes and intercepts often must co-vary just because of the basic physics of the measurement system that you're studying. Does this make sense? That's why I use this example. And uh, uh, it's obviously of no scientific value, right? Uh, now, think about um, how we should estimate these slopes. Uh, so there's two, two things uh, uh, to realize. The first is that, well, now we've got a, a slope parameter, a beta coefficient, and we split it across a bunch of cafes, pooling, right? So you're, you're, you're primed for this, right? You know you, you know you want to use a pooling estimator. So we want to have a, some distribution of slopes. There should be an average slope, and there should be some standard deviation among slopes. That's an adaptive prior. It'll look just like the other one that we had before for intercepts, and we should estimate it, and we'll get pooling. Yes, that's the right thing to do. Uh, but then there's one more step, and that step is, since intercepts and slopes are correlated, you pool across them as well. And this is the fun part. Yeah, are you ready for like the fourth dimension? <laughs> uh, I'll say that again. Because intercepts and slopes are correlated, uh, you should pool across the parameters as well. So let me take, take the perspective of the coffee robot again. You're the coffee robot, or you're a chaperone, or whatever. And you're, so as you're moving along Cafe B now, so say you do a bunch of Cafe A one week, and then the next week you're doing Cafe B, and you're marching across Cafe B in some particular week here at the bottom marching across. Uh, on the first day that you visited Cafe B, uh, the prior for your morning wait is, comes from Cafe A. Yeah? And you've got that. Uh, but now, when you visit, but then you notice, you, you get your first data point from Cafe B, and the mean is really low. In fact, you've never observed in Cafe A a wait time that short. It's the best coffee you ever had. Right? Uh, and now, the first afternoon you visit Cafe B, What's your prior, or what's your, what's your best prior for your wait time? It's not the average afternoon wait time in Cafe A anymore, because you've already learned that the average wait time at Cafe B is short. And you, and say that there's a, if, if you know the correlation 
between intercepts and slopes in the population of cafes. To make this example work, you have there need to be cafes like you know, A through M, and now we're coming to N. <laughs> uh, but there's, since there's a correlation between intercepts and slopes, now your best guess for the wait time in the afternoon is also short because they're going to correlate. Does that make sense? Your expectation is drugged down. It's not just the raw slope thing from the previous one. That is, you've got a, a prediction for the slope uh, before you ever have to sample it uh, uh, from that time because you've learned something about the intercept for that cafe. And since the intercepts and the slopes are correlated with one another, you can make an even better prediction for the afternoon. Does that make sense? Yeah? Uh, we'll have plenty of examples with real data sets uh, coming up, so bear with me. Uh, I understand that this is, again, we're in the fourth dimension here, but uh, it's the, the extending layers of what rational expectations would be given the model, right? Okay, so uh, to think about this statistically, we have a statistical population of intercepts and slopes. Uh, these are your cafes uh, that you're visiting. And uh, I'm Picturing it here, this is a two-dimensional Gaussian distribution. I've sampled some cafes from it, a lot of them. Yeah, put them on there. And uh, uh, on the horizontal axis, we have the intercepts for a given cafe. Uh, this will be on some you know, standardized scale. That's why zero is in the middle, right? Because if you have negative wait times, it's just zero is the average here. And, uh, and then on the vertical is the slope. And they have a weak correlation, right? Negatively correlated, but they're correlated. Yeah, with one another. And <clears throat> what does that mean? That means that cafes that have long morning wait times tend to have smaller differences between morning and afternoon because the slope is a difference. Yeah? Hard to think about. We'll put it on the absolute scale later. Uh, that's what the negative correlation is. And each of the marginal distribution of each of these intercepts and slopes is just Gaussian. Yeah? But the correlation is the extra bit of information that we need to estimate inside the model. So the pooling estimator in this case, and I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes explaining all the details of this to you, but the pooling estimator in this case is this distribution. We estimate the bivariate Gaussian distribution now. What do we need to do that? Uh, you need two standard deviations and a correlation. Yeah, well, then the means. But the means, you can always subtract them out and put them in the linear model, right? We don't care where the mean is. The mean's arbitrary. We can always relocate these things wherever we want arbitrarily. Uh, but to get the scale and the correlation, uh, that's what we need to estimate. Does this make sense? Is it enough to be with me just well enough to keep going, at least? Yeah? You're not going to flee the room? Yeah? It's good? All right. Um, so let me, let me walk you through a full uh, uh, synthetic data exercise with the CAFE robot, and then we'll do some real data examples as well. Uh, so we'll do... Uh, no fewer than three examples of this kind of pooling estimator. Uh, so here's our population of cafes. It's a two-dimensional Gaussian distribution. You've done plenty of these before. Uh, your posterior distributions have been higher dimensional than that, right? You've had all kinds of posterior distributions, which were, you know, 20-dimensional Gaussian distributions uh, all throughout the course. This is just a two-dimensional one. It's a hill. Yeah, <laughs> a little Gaussian hill that you're looking at. And to describe a two-dimensional Gaussian distribution, like I say, to describe a Gaussian distribution, you know all you need is a location and a variance. That's it. There's no other information needed to describe a Gaussian. That's it. That's what's wonderful about Gaussians. Two pieces of information, you're done. It's wonderful. Uh, so for a two-dimensional Gaussian distribution, you have two means, two variances, and a correlation, and you're done. <laughs> right? And then as the dimension goes up, you need more. We'll talk about that later. But let's just stay a two-dimensional land for now. You need one correlation. So there's going to be an extra parameter inside the model to estimate, and that parameter is the correlation between the intercepts and slopes. And sometimes uh, all that correlation is there for is to do the pooling for you so that information about intercepts helps you estimate slopes and vice versa, that they come between. Right? So think about the cafe robots again. What if the sample size in the morning and afternoon was radically different? For some cafe, then you'd overfit uh, whichever of those had a lot smaller sample size if you didn't do the pooling across. That's what you want to go across and handle the imbalance in sampling. So this correlation parameter is what does that, accomplishes it in the model. It lets information flow across uh, the two kinds of parameters. It uses, it exploits the fact that there's a correlation to improve estimates. Uh, uh, but other times, it, it isn't just that it's here because it 
does partial pooling for us, it's because it's a target of inference. We have questions about the association at the population level between these things, right? Like, say, between uh, socioeconomic status of a household and test scores, right? Sometimes we care about the estimate itself, something we really want to know. And then it's nice to have a parameter in your model that actually is the posterior distribution of that correlation. Yeah. So sometimes it's at a real target of inference. Okay. Um, so <coughs> uh, here's some simulated cafes. We're going to do a full simulated example and build up the multi-level model that does all this and um, take a look at it. So here's what I've done is I've sampled 20 cafes uh, from that population that has this uh, negative correlation. And uh, data over five days, morning and afternoon, 200 observations in total uh, from all these cafes. And the job of our uh, robot now is to use that data to try and uh, estimate uh, uh, not just the morning and wait time at each cafe, uh, which is in some sense in this example the key inference, uh, but also the population distribution because that will improve the estimates as well. So what you're looking at here is uh, sampled uh, intercepts and slopes. Each dot is a cafe. And the ellipses, that's the, uh, the population they've been sampled from to show you the, the sort of relative probabilities of getting cafes in different regions. Okay, here's our model. Don't panic. Uh, I'm going to take this piece by piece. Uh, these models are always the same. Sometimes they get long because you have to list all the assumptions. And the strategy in this course has always been to make you do that rather than hide it from you. Uh, it's all here. But this model isn't any different structurally than the other models you've done. It's just longer. So I'm going to take it piece by piece and show you that you already understand it. Uh, so the uh, first bit up the top, of course, is the likelihood, and we're going to move past that without comment. <laughs> right? so there's some Gaussian distribution in wait times. Yeah, yeah. Who cares? And uh, linear model is where the interesting stuff starts to happen. This is a linear regression. So, but now it has varying intercepts and varying slopes. There's an alpha for each cafe. Uh, and there's a, a beta for each cafe. And then m sub i is a dummy variable, an in, in, in zero one indicator variable for whether or not it's the morning. Yeah. And uh, now we have the pooling prior, and this is the two-dimensional Gaussian distribution. So for the way you want to read this from left to right is for each cafe, there's an alpha and beta. Right? They're paired together. There's a pair of parameters, an alpha and a beta for each cafe. There's a, a vector is what that's called. There's a vector. Uh, and, and those pairs of values are distributed as a multivariate normal with means alpha and beta and some covariance matrix S which we will spend way too much time talking about today. Well, no, we will spend the adequate amount of time talking about it. We will give it the respect it deserves. Yeah. Did you with me? This is, um, so uh, this is just describing the hill <laughs> that we looked at before. This is just the way to denote in your model that there's this two-dimensional hill. Um, so there's, for each cafe, you get a pair of, of uh, uh, parameters, an intercept and a slope. And across a large number of those cafes, then, um, they'll have means alpha and beta. And there'll be a covariance um, uh, between those pairs described by this covariance matrix S. So that's where we're going to spend some time. Oh, sorry. Here, here's the labeling uh, of all the stuff I just said. Yeah. Um, we're, well, we need to spend some time talking about the covariance matrix. Because this, I understand, uh, given the variation in backgrounds uh, in the class, some of you will not um, uh, dream of covariance matrices all the time. Uh, but these are, are simple things. Yeah, I can tell from Natalia's face that she does. Uh, but, <laughs> but uh, sorry, when you make expressions like that, I will comment on them. But no, these, these, these things are simple descriptive engines that you actually use all the time. And so, but it's worth having some standardized notation about what we're doing. Um, so covariance matrices just describe the shapes of these multivariate Gaussian uh, hills, you know, hyper hills, I guess, if it's three dimensions or more. Um, and so if we have an M by M covariance matrix, where M is the number of parameters in it, so let's think about two by two. So for if M equals two, for a two by two covariance matrix, how many parameters do you need uh, to specify the matrix, all the covariances inside of it? Um, 
Well, you need m standard deviations because for each dimension you need to say how, how stretched it is. It's the scale of each marginal dimension of it. So the scale of the intercepts and the scale of the slopes. There's, so you need two standard deviations for that. You with me? So for m equals 2. But if m equals 10, then you need 10 of those. Yeah, it, it's just a linear thing. Does that make sense? Uh, now the fun starts. But now we also need correlation parameters. So for a 2 by 2 uh, uh, Gaussian distribution, you only need one because there are two dimensions, so there's one correlation that describes how correlated they are with one another. But then you start adding some more dimensions, right? And you're going to need more. So there's an expression for the number of correlations you need, and it's m squared minus m divided by 2, or m quantity m minus 1 divided by 2. Uh, so since there's a square in there, this goes up fast. Uh, so for m equals 2, this is, I leave as an exercise to the student to verify what it is, it is 1. <laughs> right? Go ahead, take your time. <laughs> do it in your heads. Uh, but for 3, what is it? Well, then it's 3 squared, which is 9, minus 3, which is 6, divided by 2, which is 3. So you need three correlations for a three-dimensional Gaussian distribution. And then with 4, you need even more, and so on. It's become all the pairs that you have to, for every pair, you need to specify a correlation. Does that make sense? So you're counting pairs is what you're doing, counting unique pairs. Uh, so that gives you a lot of correlation parameters pretty quick. Um, in total, you need m quantity m plus 1 over 2 parameters. Uh, so for small matrices, this isn't very many. For big matrices, it's, it's actually quite a lot. Uh, uh, quite a lot. So, uh, but that will describe all the shapes and all the correlations. Um, the fun part of this, and that's easy. That's just description. It's no big deal. Uh, uh, the, the historically... Uh, challenging part of this is specifying priors. So now we have a matrix, and we need a prior for a covariance matrix. So I, I, I've been telling you all along that eventually in this course we would have distributions inside distributions. And so now we need a prior, which is a distribution, for a matrix. So now we need distributions over matrices. Yes, uh, and this is where we're going to reach it. it. works intellectually, it's just like all the other priors you've done. It's just now the object that's being spit out in the distribution is a matrix. No problem. Math is fine with that. It's just us that has, we have a problem with it, but your computer doesn't. It has no expectation of what should be coming out of the distribution. A matrix is fine. If you can spit out a scalar, you can spit out a matrix. It's no big deal. So I'll spend a little bit of time explaining this to you. The, the point, the motivation, though, is just so for this thing, this covariance in the 2x2 two two case, it's got these three parameters inside of it. We need some prior expectation before the data, where we're going to program our robot to have some expectation about the covariance, what should it be? Uh, and we want to regularize, right? We always want to regularize inference. So there's no sense in which we can have some uniform distribution over matrices. It makes no sense. Uh, so we have to do some regularization here. And there's an easy solution to this. Uh, so I want to show you how we're going to do it. Um, uh, historically, and you'll still see this in people's code, what people have done is use the, what's called the conjugate prior for a covariance matrix. This is this thing called the inverse Wisher. Uh, you should not use it. I'm just going to say that and, you know, expect hate mail or whatever. Uh, the reason you shouldn't use it is because if you use the inverse Wisher, you can't independently specify priors for the standard deviations and the correlations. And often you have different information about those things, the scales, and the associations between the dimensions, and you want to specify priors separately for them. But you can't do that with the inverse Wisher. The inverse Wisher forces you to make joint assumptions about those things. And it also does drastically bad things near the origin, near the zero points. Uh, it, it's not a good family of priors. and You should never, under any circumstance, use it. Okay? You will see it. And I spend a lot of time in reviewing papers telling people not to use this prior and giving them citations. There's a literature on why you shouldn't use this prior. Okay? Uh, and the good news is, the alternatives to use are easier to use. Uh, they're easier to think about. But to explain to you how we do it, we're going to have to do some matrix factoring. We're going to take this thing, which is our um, covariance matrix, and we're going to factor it into two other matrices. So, uh, back in secondary school, everybody did linear algebra, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, and then you forgot it, because you're a psychologically healthy person. Right? <laughs> you moved on. <laughs> right? Because, I mean, what good is math in the real world, after all? <laughs> and, uh, uh, so, well, now it's back. <laughs> so I want to give you a very brief refresher on linear algebra. And so 
the reason is because we're going to factor this thing into two other matrices, one which is a matrix where the scale parameters uh, are along the diagonal and everything else is a zero. So the diagonal matrix with the scale parameters along the diagonal. So it's just a, a matrix representation of the standard deviations and then a correlation matrix. And it turns out if you, you can get a covariance matrix by taking uh, that matrix of standard deviations, multiplying it by the correlation, and then again by the matrix of standard deviations, you get the covariance matrix factor. So it's just matrix multiplication rules. We want to assign priors to these sigmas and to this thing, which I'm calling R, the correlation matrix. Okay, that's where we want to assign our priors. Then we can have a prior for the correlations, how strong the correlations are, right? And uh, we probably have, we, or I'm going to argue, we should have prior expectations that the correlations are not big especially if the matrix is large. Uh, and then you make information about the sigmas to do regularization as well. So how does this work? Uh, here's your, I'm going to do 10 minutes on matrix algebra. Okay? It will be, it'll be gentle and fun and you'll remember secondary school and all the fun you had in secondary school. <laughs> right? Uh, so uh, matrices are nice. Um, uh, to remind you uh, what the work you did with this back, back in time, uh, matrix algebra is just a bunch of shortcuts for working with lists of numbers. It, it's convenient. You don't have to do it. There's nothing you can do with matrix algebra you couldn't do with systems of equations. It's just easier with matrix algebra. There are fewer steps involved, but it's, it's just a bunch of shortcuts. It's a grammar for making compact operations on systems of equations. That's all it is. Um, and uh, so there's just a few simple rules, and those rules are structured the way they are because they they compress down operations on systems of equations. That's all it's for. Uh, and so matrix multiplication is just, it's just a recipe. It's, it's among the easiest recipes. And so I was trying to think, like, what's the easiest recipe for food? And I think it's an omelet, right? Is there anything easier than an omelet? You just spill some eggs in a hot dish. And wait a minute, <laughs> right? It's about it. Then you got an omelet. Nobody can mess up an omelet. <laughs> I know you're thinking about this, like, invent a way. If you can invent a way to mess up an omelet, let me know. But, I thought, so if you can make an omelet, you can multiply matrices. That's my mantra right there, okay? So we're, let's make an omelet. Uh, <laughs> so we want to, our abstract task is we got two square matrices. We're only worried about the easiest case. We're going to multiply two matrices, two square matrices of the same dimension. The answer will be a matrix of the same dimension, uh, right? So easiest case, nothing exotic at all. Here's the rule. If you've got a matrix here, this is what I'm going to call the capital letter matrix, <laughs> A, B, C, D, uh, and we're going to multiply it. Um, on its right by the lowercase letter matrix, A, B, C, D. Uh, the, the mental trick here is that you just make a grid like this. Uh, put the, the matrix that's on the left, uh, on the, on the left-hand side here, and the other one on the top, and then your answer. We need four um, cells to fill in, and we're going to put the answer there. You with me? This is the trick I was taught in secondary school. Yeah? And, uh, and then the rule is, you just take each of these four boxes and you pay attention to the row and column that connect to it. Uh, so in that case, uh, in this case, we've got the first row of the matrix on the left, A and B. There is color on this slide, and those of you watching at home can see that, and those of you in the room can't because this, this beamer is dead or something. No longer shows the color red, obviously. <laughs> I should have chosen blue. Anyway, the A and B and A and C are red, trust me. Uh, on my laptop they are. <laughs> and uh, 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 so what you do is you take each of the elements in this row and you multiply them in order by each of the elements in that column that connects. And then you add those products together. This is called a dot product, which is something you don't have to remember, but it's fun to say. And uh, so what that means is capital A times lowercase a plus capital B times lowercase c. You see how that works? You take the big A, you multiply it by the little a, uh, and then you add that to the big B times the C, because you're moving down that column and across that row and doing it in sequence. Yeah? This is it. This is your omelet is done. Uh, you just got to do it for the other three now. And so the other three works the same way. Uh, for the cell in the upper right, big A times, now we move over to the column that connects to that cell. So it's big A times B, big B times little D, and that's the sum that goes there. And then you do the calculation. Yeah, and that's it. And that's matrix multiplication. You're done. And now you are among the 1% of all humans who know how to multiply matrices. Congratulations. 1%? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know the percent. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Anyway, it's not, it's not a survival skill. <laughs> right? this is, it's better to learn how to make fire if you're going to learn something. But I, I teach you this not because you're going to need to do this by hand. Um, uh, you know, although it's healthy, if you want to practice on the bus on the way home, I think you know, doing some atrial multiplication is good for you. <laughs> no, just, I'm teaching this to you uh, to demystify what the notation is, so that when you see it, you know why it's like that. And, and actually, not only why it's like that, but why it's a good thing to represent things this way. is because it make, it's compact, and it's clear, and it's a universal way to describe your assumptions and say what's going on. And this is the only thing you need to remember to understand how the operation works. So let's go back to this thing. Uh, this factoring, and let me show you uh, very quickly how to apply this rule to get back. So, if we, we're going to take the one on the left and the one in the middle, that is our, our matrix of, of uh, scale parameters, and we want to multiply it by the correlation matrix, again, set them up so the one's on the left, the other's on the top. We're going to have an answer in the middle that's the same dimension. Apply the same rules, right? So, sigma alpha times 1 is sigma alpha plus 0 times rho gives us sigma alpha, right? Because 0 times rho is 0. So it's sigma alpha plus 0, which is sigma alpha. So the answer is sigma alpha. Um, for this one, it's sigma alpha times rho is sigma alpha rho plus 0 times 1. So we get rho sigma alpha. You with me? Isn't this fun? No, it's not, but <laughs> this, is, this is just here, not because you're going to need to do this to do the statistics, just so you understand why this factoring makes sense. Yeah. And, uh, and then the bottom row, the same idea, 0 times 1 is 0, uh, sigma beta times rho gives you rho sigma beta. And then 0 times rho plus sigma beta times 1 gives you sigma beta. And then the second step, we take the answer from that previous thing, we put it on the left, and we got to multiply it by the matrix of scale parameters, again, same deal. Um, and now we get sigma alpha times sigma alpha sigma alpha squared plus rho sigma alpha times zero sigma alpha squared, which is the variance of the intercepts. Right, it's a squared standard deviation. It's the variance of the intercepts. That's what goes inside a covariance matrix on the diagonal. And uh, on the, at the other end, we get sigma squared beta. That's the variance of the slopes. Yeah, because it's the squared standard deviation. Um, and then off the diagonal, we've got covariances. And a covariance is exactly a correlation times the product of the standard deviations. That's a covariance. It's the definition of a covariance. Yeah, that's what it is. And this is our covariance matrix. Love it. Yeah, so we want to put priors on each of these symbols inside this thing, not on the whole matrix. And that's, our, that's why we factor it. Does that make sense? Yeah, enough sense? Okay. And so that's why we write this thing <laughs> inside our model notation, uh, where we build the covariance matrix. So we define, we've got the separate little sigmas, uh, correlation matrix capital R, uh, which could be any dimension. Here it's two by two, so it's got one parameter inside of it, but it could be really big, right? If it was three by three, you would have three correlation parameters inside of it. Um, and uh, we need priors for everything. Uh, these are the easy priors. I'm going to skip over these quickly. Alpha and beta are the means of the population of cafes. Yeah? And then uh, we're going to put these, these uh, very weakly regularizing half Cauchy priors on the scale parameters again. Exponentials are also fine. Sometimes exponentials are better. In fact, but, but there's nothing new here or exciting to talk about. The new exciting thing is how to put a prior on a correlation matrix. So um, here's the thing about this. Uh, in the two by two case, um, you've got one parameter to put, a, to put a prior on. And so it isn't very intellectually challenging. Uh, so a correlation can vary between minus one and positive one. And regularization in that case would mean we want a prior that's skeptical of extreme values. Uh, so that's easy. We just have some hill, <laughs> right, that goes down near one and minus one. That would be a nice prior. Beta distributions work great for that. There's no problem there. The, the intellectual challenge is we want some, I want to teach you some strategy that will scale to big, uh, magnificent correlation matrices <laughs> with any number of little correlation parameters inside of it. And what you absolutely cannot ever do, <laughs> ever, uh, is put independent beta priors on every correlation parameter inside that matrix. If you do this, you will get nonsense out of your markup chain. And the reason is because 
Uh, all the correlations inside of a correlation matrix have to, are jointly constraining one another. If one of them is really big, it constrains the values of all the others. Right? If, if, two, if two things, two variables inside a data set, just think of it in terms of a data set, are almost perfectly correlated to one another, that affects how correlated other things are with either of those. Right? The correlations jointly determine one another. They can't be perfectly independent. And so you need a prior over the whole matrix. And there's just no dodging it. There's no simpler way to live. Uh, it just has to be true. Luckily for you, this problem has been solved uh, many times. Well, there's a really nice solution. There are a number of solutions. And the one I want you guys to use is this so-called LKJ uh, correlation. So let me explain that to you. And then eventually we will actually have some estimates here. Now we're on time. This is good. So here's how this works. Um, LKJ is the initials of the people who published a paper on it in 2009. Uh, uh, Lewandowski, Korvika, and Joe. That's the last name, Joe. His first name is not Joe. <laughs> uh, but Joe is the last name. And this is a great paper. It's a really nice paper where they address this problem. And uh, uh, the idea is, um, as I said, to have a family of priors, regularizing priors, over correlation matrices. And uh, they have this uh, nice construction, uh, uh, which we now call the LKJ uh, uh, family of priors. In the paper, they call it the onion method. So you might call it the onion prior instead. And the reason for that is not important. But uh, uh, what's nice about this is there's got a single shape parameter, which um, describes either the skepticism or enthusiasm for extreme correlations. So thinking about it in one dimension now, where on the right, I'm showing you three cases of the shape parameter. The horizontal axis is the correlation, varies between minus one and positive one. So zero in the middle means no correlation. Yeah? Um, at the top, when we set 80 equals to one, that's uniform. That is, and so what I'm showing you in the density is, I don't know, a thousand samples uh, from, uh, from this uh, prior. And so every correlation is equally plausible when 80 equals one. Yeah? As the, as the dimension of the matrix goes up, uh, uh, the ends fold down, though, for eta equals 1. It has to because the correlations start to constrain one another. And if a really big matrices, like a 10 by 10 correlation matrix, the correlations all have to be small uh, in expectation. Or if any one of them is big, all the others have to be small. Yeah? So they, they jointly constrain one another in powerful ways. Uh, uh, as eta goes above 1, it, you get matrices which are concentrated around correlations of 0. And so what we usually want to do when we fit models is we want to use etas that are a little bit above 1 so that the model is skeptical of extreme correlations. This is the regularization effect. Uh, it's, it's a good thing to do because it reduces overfitting. Yeah? Otherwise, you're going to get the sample will rule, and you'll get these spurious, low-evidence correlations uh, estimated. The other thing, which I can't, I, I have yet to come up with a, uh, a data analysis situation where I'd want to do this, but I offer it <laughs> just in the sake of understanding, you can make eta less than one. And in that case, uh, it's very enthusiastic for extreme correlations. So I don't know. I was trying to figure out some joke about American politics, but I, I failed. So there you go. That's all you get. Right. <laughs> uh, so um, here's what the model looks like. Uh, in, in this is the simulated CAFE data. And by the way, this is a, you should run this. This is all in Chapter 13. You should sit down and run this through your console and get an idea how it works. You can simulate the data. You can do it multiple times. You can change the parameters, make the correlation strong or weak, whatever you like. Um, the model notation is, is similar to the sort of things you've done before. Got a little bit of color here to help you understand what connects to what. Uh, the red here is uh, intercepts, and the green is slopes. So you'll see in the linear model, we've got um, an intercept A underscore cafe for each cafe and a slope B underscore cafe for each cafe. And then when we specify the multivariate normal prior, they go inside a vector together, right? Which is clustered by cafe. The whole vector is clustered by cafe. You see that? Because it's a vector of two that's clustered by cafe. Yeah? And uh, then we put the mean um, in this dmv norm 2 is just a version of the multivariate normal where you can put in a vector of sigmas and a correlation matrix instead of a covariance matrix. So that it deals with the factoring for you. 
and it just multiplies them together, exactly as I showed you on previous slides to get the covariance matrix. And then the rest is the stuff I just showed you. Yeah? Good time? Okay. So, oh yeah, uh, uh, there's, there's our sigma, right? Vector of, of sigmas, and there's the uh, LKJ correlation matrix, the onion method uh, correlation prior. Yeah, with, with eta equals two, which means it's skept slightly skeptical of extreme correlations. Very slightly. If your data, if there are really extreme correlations in your data, this model will learn them, right? Where it's easy, these weakly regularizing priors can be overwhelmed quite readily. Um, the thing about regularization is super important for correlation matrices because you need a lot of information to estimate correlations. Uh, it's, it's much harder than estimating slopes. And so regularization is super important because you can get all sorts of spurious inferences uh, from this. Your overfitting risk is really extreme. Yeah, so I think I've, I've frequently made, I make lots of bad jokes, but one of the bad jokes I make routinely in stats is that the, 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 one of the things you should, it's never too early to teach your child about the importance of regularizing a covariance matrix, right? So, uh, communism doesn't work, that's the second thing, but <laughs> sorry, <laughs> no, this is a running joke with the, the value that I have, <laughs> but uh, uh, covariance matrices, uh, uh, they must be regularized. All right, so, uh, Posterior correlation. Um, uh, if we, we run this model, we get a posterior distribution for the correlation parameter. Uh, and just extracting it out here, as you see in the code, there's a matrix called row. And um, the elements at 1, 2, right, first column, uh, first row, second column is our the little row thing. It's the correlation between the others. Uh, the diagonal is 1s. And so when we plot that correlation, that's what I'm showing you here in the solid line, the posterior distribution of the correlation between intercepts and slopes is quite negative, right? Because that's what I forced it to be in the simulation. Uh, it's a very negative result. The prior is this gentle little hill, right? That's the onion prior with eight equals two. Make sense? So it's skeptical of extreme correlations. Uh, but there's a lot of evidence of a, of a strong negative correlation in this case. Uh, what does that look like on the outcome scale? What, uh, uh, on the effect it has on inference is to do pooling across intercepts and slopes. And here's what it ends up looking like. So this is a scatter plot where the horizontal is the intercepts. That's the morning wait times, right? And the slope is the difference between the morning and afternoon wait time at each cafe. And the filled circles like last week, are the raw data estimates. If we take only the data for each cafe and we just compute that with pure arithmetic, this is the fixed effect estimate, right? This is the same estimate you'd get out of a fixed effects model. Uh, that's what the field points are. It's just raw empiricism being objective, objective, and using only the data for that cafe. Yeah, the wrong thing to do, right? Uh, but that's what the field circles are. Uh, the open circles are the pooling estimators, the partial pooling estimators. The, the, and they have shrunk, but now they're shrinking in two dimensions. So good times, yeah? And they're shrinking towards the center of gravity inside this distribution defined by the population, the, the adaptive prior that defines the statistical population of cafes. And uh, so the ellipses are showing you that. That's those ellipses are the contours of that bivariate Gaussian distribution that's been estimated from the data. Yeah, the hill that we talked about before. Uh, so the lines connect uh, the two points for each cafe, and you'll see that they are shrinking uh, towards the center of gravity in this thing. They're actually, they're shrinking towards a line, basically, uh, in the middle of this. Uh, and and uh, so it'll help, probably, to think about particular points um, in this uh, case. Now, this is why I should have zoomed this out and showed you before. Yeah, so the, the field circles are unpooled and the open ones are pooled. Um, let's consider this cafe here up at the top to help you understand what's going on. Uh, so this cafe has um, a very extreme slope. Its slope, the difference between morning and afternoon wait times, is much, I would say this, less small, it's <laughs> closer to zero uh, than the other cafes in the population. It's, it's, it's on the tail of the slope distribution. Do you see that? Uh, uh, and it's in the raw estimate. 
Its intercept is perfectly typical, right? The intercept is right in the middle of the horizontal dimension. It's a perfectly typical cafe in terms of its morning wait time. It's a very atypical cafe in terms of the difference between the morning and afternoon. Yeah? It's always busy or something like that, or it's always average. I don't know. Uh, and um, uh, now the shrinkage, however, changes both the intercept and the slope. So even though the intercept is typical, the intercept gets shrunk. Uh, well, shrunk. Which direction does it go? It gets increased. So you can understand maybe the first order realization um, is that the slope has got to come down. The slope comes down because it's unreasonably high. It's incredibly unlikely. It's probably overfit. It's probably the robot needs to get some more data from that cafe. It's probably not actually that high. So you can see why the slope comes down. Yeah? I assert it. You can see, right? It's like a mind trick. You can see what it, the slope comes down. Uh, but why must the intercept also change? The intercept must also change because to do otherwise would be illogical. Uh, and why? Because intercepts and slopes are correlated. They're correlated. They're negatively correlated. If the slope is too high, then the intercept is too low. I'll say it again. If the slope is too high, then your estimate, if your estimate of the, of the slope is too high, then your estimate of the intercept is probably too low because they're negatively correlated with one another. And so, uh, they move, this, this moves down and to the right. And so the pooling estimators increase the intercept a little bit um, and decrease the slope a lot. They don't, it doesn't increase the intercept much because it's typical, it's in the middle, but it still moves up, right? Because if you move the slope down, you have to retain the correlation between the two. And this is a consequence, a logical, optimal consequence of the structure of the model. But the great thing, this is what I love about Bayesian inference, is you didn't have to realize you needed to do this, right? You just set up the model, turn the crank, the golem figures it out. Yeah, and then we try to figure out why it did that uh, and realize that this is the right thing to do. Does this make some sense? Yeah? Uh, so I encourage you in your free time uh, to analyze other uh, cafes in this and tell yourself similar stories about why they move the way they do. Uh, each, each cafe is precious and unique snowflake uh, that has its own story of pooling and is worthy of respect. All right. Um, <coughs> it, it is easier, I think, quite often, uh, this is the, the general theme of the course, uh, it's easier quite often not to look at pooling on the parameter scale, but more on the outcome scale. Uh, right? So slopes are just little little motors inside the tide machine, the little gears inside the tide machine, to use that metaphor again. And so plotting up the slope, while even though that's what's in the posterior distribution, it, it isn't necessarily the most meaningful way to think about how the pooling operates. So let's instead generate, think about it in predictions for waiting times. Use the slope to make predictions for afternoons. And in that case, um, uh, what I've redrawn on the right, it's the same information as on the left, but it's been pushed out as an outcome prediction. So the bottom is, is the same, right? Because the intercept gives you the prediction for the morning wait. Right? So it's the same. But the vertical dimension is different now. Now it's the sum of an intercept and a slope because that gives you the afternoon wait time. Yeah? And so that's the vertical dimension. And uh, again, we can draw the ellipses for the Gaussian distribution of these things uh, come from the posterior. Again, the code to do this, to draw these graphs, is in the chapter. If you like ellipses, uh, there's a command called ellipse. <laughs> it will happily draw ellipses for you. Um, and then you can see the shrinkage. They're, they're, everything's climbing uphill, right, so to speak. If you think about the center of that, by very Gaussian at the top of a hill, everything wants to be on the top of the hill. But the rate at which they climb is proportional to how far they are from the center of the hill. Yeah, because that's the shrinkage uh, that goes on. And so the cafes that are really extreme near the bottom of the hill, they run really fast. And the ones near the top don't move that much. Yeah, because of the shrinkage, right? It's the model skepticism about extreme estimates. Is this good? Does this make sense? Um, after you sleep on this, it'll make a lot more sense. It's one of those things uh, that works that way. Okay, we're doing great on time, actually. This is what I hope to get to today. So, this is this phenomenon of multidimensional shrinkage. It, uh, what happens in one dimension happens in two dimensions, happens in three dimensions, happens in four dimensions. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, uh, you can get shrinkage across all kinds of different effects 
that apply to the same cluster type. So here it's cafes as a cluster type, and for every effect you estimate about cafes, you want shrinkage among them because that's the optimal use of information. Yeah? Um, when you have multiple cluster types, you don't get pooling across cluster types. You, know, you get pooling within cluster types across the effects. So I'll say that again. You get pooling across effects within each type of cluster. You don't get pooling across cluster types. Does that make sense? There's no sense in which learning about an experimental block tells you anything about a particular chimpanzee. Right? You don't get pooling across cluster types. But learning one feature about chimpanzee, a chimpanzee tells you about other features in the chimpanzee because there's a correlation structure among those features within individuals. Yeah? Things like that. Uh, so this is partial pooling and shrinkage just as before, and we want to do it uh, because we get improved accuracy just like before. Uh, often, uh, I should say, often the correlations between the different effects are very small, or there's not much information, and so you don't get much pooling across types. This is an example where there is a lot of pooling across intercepts and slopes, but routinely there isn't much because uh, there isn't much structure across it that you can estimate. And in that case, um, treating these as independent effects is harmless. Uh, but it's not harder to fit the model that does it right. And so my advice is to try the right model first. Uh, absolutely. Okay. Uh, I should say non-Bayesian packages like LME4 can have a really hard time doing this. But this is no problem if you're using Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Well, no problem. It's, it's, it's a tiny problem. <laughs> it's, uh, it can do it. Uh, uh, but uh, on Friday, I'll tell you uh, how to solve the, the typical problem with it. Okay, got a couple of minutes. I think I can get through this example because uh, it's so structurally easy. You remember the UC Berkeley admissions data? The saga of the dean that thought they were going to get sued? Yeah, uh, it turned out they weren't going to get sued. <laughs> um, and uh, so here's the data again, just to remind you. We've got applications within departments, and we're interested in the effect of an application being submitted by a male human, yeah? And uh, whether that increases or decreases the uh, odds of an application's acceptance. And the, the interesting causal story with these data is you can easily reach the wrong inference if you don't cluster on department, because the departments have radically different mean rates of acceptance, and men and women apply to different departments on average. Uh, so this is, a, let's say, this is a famous example of what's called Simpson's Paradox in the literature. We, we spent a lot of time on this, had like half a day on this example uh, last week, week before, week before last. Um, actually, last year. <laughs> Wasn't it last year? Yeah. And uh, so um, to remind you, uh, uh, we can do this with pooling estimators too. Uh, so here's the varying intercepts version of this model where we have an intercept for each department and we have an adaptive prior. Um, for the departments. Yeah, you see this? So now the, the prior for A sub department is normal with mean alpha and standard deviation sigma. So this is a varying intercepts model. So it's going to estimate a unique intercept for each department, but it's going to use partial pooling. This would be good if you had, first, because the departments vary in the amount of data each provides. So there's imbalance. So this is the right thing to do. Yeah? This makes sense? Um, what about with varying slopes? Well, the effect of Male, the effect of an application being male could also vary across departments, and hint, it does. Uh, <laughs> so, um, uh, this is a good uh, suspenseful moment to pause. <laughs> yeah, I could finish, but I'll let you think about it. Um, uh, we're, when you come back on Friday, we'll pick up with this slide and the varying slopes model. And I want to show you that uh, the slope varies across departments, even though the average effect of being male is just about zero. Uh, and this is one of the great things about varying slopes models, is the effect to detect who is helped by the aspirin, uh, so to speak. Uh, okay, with that, thank you for your indulgence, and I will see you um, bright and early on Friday morning.